Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second of the three webinars in the South African pandemics, past and present, the Spanish flu of 1918 to 1919, and the light it cast on COVID-19 series. We've just passed 100 days of lockdown. South Africa, said to be in the eye of the storm of the COVID-19 pandemic, has just registered over 4,000 deaths. In 1918, according to Professor Phillips, the Spanish flu pandemic killed over 300,000 people in just 42 days. At the outbreak of the deadly influenza pandemic in 1918, it was believed that the influenza was caused by a bacterium. Very little was known about viruses or how it was spread. In this webinar, the focus is on virology and trying to understand why this virus was so deadly. We have historian Professor Howard Phillips in conversation with virologist Professor Ed Rabichki. Professor Howard Phillips taught in the Departments of History and Public Health at UCT, where he pioneered the teaching of the history of health, disease and medicine. He's the author of several books in these fields. Professor Ed Rybitschke qualified in microbiology and virology at the University of Cape Town and has taught virology since 1981. His current research interests are centered on developing novel expression systems for the production of human and animal vaccines and making high value biologics in plants. He has a strong interest in the history of virology and has public given public lectures on influenza and its vaccines for many years. I'm now going to hand over to Professor Howard Phillips. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to this second uh, webinar. Um, some weeks ago, uh, Judge Dennis Davis interviewed uh, Professor Glenda Gray uh, of the Medical Research Council, and his opening uh, remark to her was, well, Glenda, we are all epidemiologists and virologists today, aren't we? Well, uh, fortunately, this afternoon, we have a real virologist uh, here, and that's Ed Rabichki. Um, Ed and I are going to discuss aspects of the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-1919, and eventually uh, make some comparisons perhaps with COVID-19. And our conversation will range over uh, aspects, particularly from a virological point of view. So the first question we should uh, pose is really, what is an influenza virus? Um, Ed, over to you. Thanks, Howard. Um, I'm going to have to correct both of you who've said my name so far, because it's Rybitsky. My grandmother would be turning over in her grave if I let anybody get away with that. Um, I'm going to share some slides quickly on this topic. Starting with this one, influenza, it's a disease and a virus. So it's a contagious respiratory illness caused by influenza viruses. So it's a bit of a circular definition that infect nose, throat and lungs. It can cause mild to severe illness and can at times can lead to death. Now, the important thing to remember here is that mild is a relative term. The common cold is mild. Flu generally is not. The type of disease you get is fever and chills, cough, sore throat, runny nose, muscle or body aches. This is a very important symptom. Back when um, I had Professor John Moody as a, lecture, as a guest lecturer occasionally, he'd ask my class, have you had flu this season? And half the people have put up their hands. And he said, OK, did you have um, such body aches that you could hardly get out of bed? Your mind was fuzzy and you were sick for two weeks and you'd let, be left with about two hands and he'd say, OK, you had flu, the rest of you I don't feel sorry for. And vomiting and diarrhea, also reasonably common symptoms, which begins to sound a lot like another disease right now. Difference is that the average incubation period is about 48 hours and full recovery can take a month or more, although it's two weeks sharing, is, huh? eh? and I need to be told if it's not sharing, is it not sharing? Is it not sharing? OK, two weeks is more common for seasonal flu. But the disease, what does the disease do? Seasonal influenza, just common, so-called common seasonal influenza. 
can kill 300 to 600,000 people worldwide every year. The complication of that is when you get a pandemic, that can kill between 250,000, which is what the 2009 pandemic did, to 100 million, which is the upper limit of what the 1918 flu did in a year or less. So you can get in history that has already been documented, you can get up to 100 million deaths from one pandemic or as few as 250,000 like we had in 2009. And I'm going to stop sharing there because we can get onto what the virus particles look like, but I think that's enough of the virology, Howard, or do you think we should go on and do a bit more? I, th I think um, lay the groundwork a little bit more, uh, uh, Ed, and that will give me an opportunity to talk about the history. Sure. Ed, sorry, Ed, yes. if I could come in here, if you could just show the full screen. I was trying to. <laughs> it should That's have, okay. but evidently didn't. I'm going to go back and try that again. So sharing. I am sharing that and I'm doing that. Do I have a full screen? No. Now I have a full screen. Now you do. Now you do. Thank you. I, I love this technology. It differs from Zoom to Teams to every other thing you can possibly mention. Okay, seasonal flu in South Africa kills about 6,000 to 11,000 people every year. And about half those deaths are in elderly and about 30% in HIV infected people, because of course we have a huge HIV infected population. And the highest rates of hospitalization are in the elderly, 65 and up, which is puts me firmly in the bracket, HIV infected people and children less than five years old. Interestingly, pregnant women are at increased risk of hospitalization and people with chronic illnesses, again, sounding like another disease that we may be familiar with. So diabetes, lung disease, and heart disease. People with these chronic illnesses are at increased risk of being hospitalized and of dying. And people with TB, which again is a huge problem in South Africa. Then you get to the deadliest disease in history, which I think Howard will then take over from. Yeah, thank you. Um, looking at that, uh so-called Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-1919. Um, I thought given that the focus of uh, this webinar is a virological perspective, I would try and just um, imagine my way into a, a viral history of the mm. pandemic to, to try and get a sense of um, how viruses fit in and their behavior. Um, the, the danger is, of course, that one almost personifies a virus into into a living being, a living human thinking being, and that's a great danger. We must uh, watch a, that we don't spill over into that. But looking at that um, pandemic, um, it, it seems as if 1918 is when it made its big public debut. But what virologists are telling us is that it indeed may already have been brewing several years before that. Some suggest even perhaps uh, from 1900. But as a historian, of course, one is looking for some particular moment in time that may have triggered it. And of course, the key moment is 1914, the beginning of World War I. And why is that so important? Is because World War I congregated young men in particular, soldiers and sailors, in unprecedented numbers of tight, close overcrowding. I want to just see if I can call up uh, two slides to, to make this point. Uh, that's... Yep. I'm, I'm waiting for it to come. Howard, we can see it. You can. Oh, well, uh, I can't, but you are. OK. Um, and that's ha has the second slide come up? No. Um, yeah, let me 
I swear they've changed Microsoft Teams between this week and last week. It worked differently last week. So um, that's uh, a slide of No, that's not coming up. Um, what yes. I, yeah, there we go. Um, right, okay, not not just a ship, but as you can see, a uh, very distinctly uh, camouflaged ship. It's a troop ship um, carrying troops in large numbers, but really keep your eye on the same troop ship as we zoom in on it. That's what I mean in terms of huge numbers of soldiers congregating in unprecedented numbers. And that's what World War I uh, uh, did. It congregated thousands and thousands and thousands of young men in trenches, in camps, in prisoner of war camps, in on troop trains. And that for a virus is an almost irresistible opportunity to spread. And so it rather looks as if 1914, 1915, this influenza virus, which had been circulating, began to take full advantage of these heavily overcrowded conditions. And there are a couple of markers that something is brewing, something is happening already before 1918. From 1915, 1916, there are reports from different parts of the world of unusual, unusually severe influenza. No one pays too much attention to it, except in retrospect. And then at the end of 1916 and the beginning of 1917, there are two outbreaks in two huge military camps, one at Etape in northern France, a British military camp, and the other in Aldershot in uh, southern England. And these are outbreaks of something which doctors at the time, military doctors at the time, uh, call purulent bronchitis. Again, uh, they don't pay too much uh, further attention to it, because it doesn't spread beyond these camps. And by early in 1917, uh, it, it more or less has vanished. And then in 1918, in March 1918, influenza makes a public debut at a military camp in Kansas in the Midwest of the United States. And that is the beginning of the first wave of this great so-called Spanish flu uh, pandemic of 1918. So it rather looks as, and I think Ed, this is this is the nature of the influenza virus, is that it constantly mutates and changes. And um, this first wave uh, goes widely across the United States from one military camp to the next, to the next, and then across the Atlantic uh, to uh, Europe and the Western Front. And then uh, it reaches Spain. Uh, Spain is neutral, so there's no censorship, and so the label Spanish flu is attached to it. And then uh, it mutates once again in about August, September 1918 to produce not only a very infectious brand of influenza, but this time one which is also deadly. And that's the big killer, the second wave which touches South Africa in September and then spreads throughout South Africa with devastating effect. And then there's another wave in 1919, the third wave, it's nothing like as severe, perhaps because herd immunity had already been gained. So if we look at uh, the uh, prehistory of the Spanish flu and then the history itself, what one is constantly aware of is that this is a virus which is mutating and changing all the time. And each time it adds something to it, greater transmissibility and then eventually the ability to kill in large numbers and to spread very rapidly indeed. So my question then to you, Ed, as a historian, if that's the, the sort of the pattern of changing influenza virus becoming more and more serious, getting the ability to spread more and more extensively and rapidly, my question to you is how and why does an influenza virus mutate? How, how does it change? Over now, to you. That's a great questions. I'm going to need you to relinquish control of the slides so that I can put something up. Yeah, I'll do that. 
Can you start? I hope I'll do that. No. Right, over to you, Ed. Right. So um, I'm going to add a little bit of a historical aspect to this. This is Roz Hauser, an ex um, honor student of mine who's presently a virologist in the US. She's um, crouching next to a tombstone of Private Harry Hubert Underdown of the Queen's Regiment on the 21st of February 1917. Now this of course is before the recognized pandemic broke out and this is in reference to your comment Howard about the camp in Etable because that's you know, John Oxford, for example, in the UK is uh, is convinced that that's where it started. But it was there was a precursor of a mild disease that then broke out as an extremely severe disease. I'm just going to go through a couple of slides. Here's a, another one from Cape Town. It sort of bookends that um, the pre-epidemic and the later stage of the epidemic. This is a nurse who died at the Weinberg Military Hospital in Cape Town. This is how it spread. Are you talking one year? In the course of a single year, it's somewhere in the middle of um, on the sorry, in, somewhere in Western Europe, possibly from Kansas. It either came from Kansas and went to Europe or it went back to Kansas from somebody, uh, one of the nurses from the US military establishment who was going home again. And in a year, it spread all around the world. And in the course of that spreading, it seemed to become a lot nastier. So to get to how bad it could get and why it got like that, it had a death toll of at least 50 million and possibly up to 100 million. And Howard, I think it was your symposium you had at UCT, which came up with that hugely increased figure yeah. of the 20 yeah. million that had been quoted up till then. So it probably infected over a third of humans alive at the time, which is about 1.5 billion. So the case fatality rate was around about between 7.5 and 15%. So it's a lot higher than the 3% that is also generally quoted. And it was unusual because it seemed to in affect mainly young adults. And this is a very famous graph that I have replotted that comes from data from 1919 from the US, where in red here you have the 1928-1929 mortality figures for influenza. There's a small kids um, between naught and five are quite badly affected and then people over 50 are increasingly affected. So you have the classic U-shaped graph. The 1918, 1919 in blue here, on the other hand, is a W-shaped graph. The highest mortality was people with an average age of around 30. And I've plotted here something that could have happened if people over 30 had not probably been exposed to a virus in either the 1883 or 1889 epidemic stroke pandemics that actually gave them some immunity to the virus. So in other words, people 35 and older had a good chance of having been exposed to a virus that gave them some protection to this new virus. And the question is, of course, how do you get the new virus? A few words of explanation here. This is the virus particle itself, it has two external proteins, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, and here I must give a shout out to Russell Kitely in Canberra, Australia, who's about the best virus graphic artist I know. Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are HA and NA. Influenza virus A, which is the one that causes pandemics, it's the only one that's been associated with pandemics. It's first isolated in 1933 in the UK when a researcher caught it from a ferret and there's some anecdotes about to and fro transmission from researchers to ferret and ferret to researcher, but the fact that the researcher got what they had inoculated into a ferret and they then managed to passage it back again and show that it caused the disease that was presently going around, um, then led to its isolation, biological isolation. And from that time, we've discovered many subtypes. 
which are defined by HA and NA types. What HA and NA types are present? And there's 17 known hemagglutinin subtypes, one only described in bats, in fact, I think more than one now in bats, and nine neuraminidase or NA subtypes. So you can get up to 40 different combinations, nearly all of which can only be found in birds. So it's an avian virus. It comes to us from birds. The important thing is immunity to the different subtypes. So if you have an H1 versus an H2, for example, does not cross protect. So here's a, I do like this, and I'm going to show it to you just because I can. This is a rotating picture by Russell Kitely of an influenza virus particle, which shows the proteins on the outside, which define whether you can become immune to it or whether you are immune to it or not. And the proteins on the inside, matrix protein, nuclear protein, and the nucleic acid that help in the immunity. Um, you have antibodies and T cells. Antibodies are predominantly directed against the outside proteins and cellular immunity works um, to a large extent on all proteins of the virus, which leads to drift and shift. You've got an idea of what the virus particle looks like and how, what it's composed of. Two different modes of the virus changing is antigenic drift and antigenic shift. And to illustrate it in a simplistic way, here's a virus at the beginning, let's call it year one. Um, the, vi the vaccine that is available matches the virus and protection is effective, so only unvaccinated people are infected. Vaccinated people are not. Go to year two, there's a couple of changes in the virus, but they're not enough to change the fact that you are immune to it. In other words, your immunity protects you. So people who've had the virus are protected and people who are vaccinated are infected. Push through to year four when there's enough changes accumulated in the outside proteins, in particular the HA protein. So the vaccine doesn't match the um, circulating virus. Vaccinated people and people who've had the live virus can both be infected. The point of this though is that it would probably be a mild infection because the virus won't have changed enough that it'll completely negate your previous immune status. So in other words, you do have a level of immunity. It'll stop you getting badly sick, but it won't stop you getting infected. That's antigenic drift. Antigenic shift is when you get genetic reassortment, so-called. So in other words, it's a mixture of human viruses quite often bird viruses and potentially other animal viruses, like for example, a pig virus. You need more than one of these to infect a cell at the same time. That cell could be in a human potentially, or it could be in a pig, because the pig is a really good mixing vessel. And that action, that infection by a human virus, that infection by a bird virus of a cell somewhere in a human, in a pig, gives rise to a new pandemic flu virus. And to illustrate this by simple colors of the surface of the virus, here's the HA and NA proteins in different colors. Pre-1957, we had the same virus that caused the Spanish flu or the 1918 flu, had been in the human population for close on um, 40 years, sorry, 30 some years by that point, and had basically become um, tolerated, become relatively mild, it wasn't causing the same disease as it did in 1918. Um, and you had HA1 and NA1, circulating seasonal virus. What happened in 1957 is a new virus suddenly arrived, which had a completely changed hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. So in other words, the appearance of the outside of the virus is completely different. Very few of the population were immune. So it infected a lot of people, caused quite severe disease and killed over 3 million people. In 1968, that changed again. You ended up with a virus in the human population that caused the pandemic that had HA3 and NA2. So it only changed the hemagglutinin. So there was partial immunity in the human population, but not to the hemagglutinin. And that virus, again, caused a couple of million deaths. And again, the population was quite considerably smaller than it is now. So the fact it killed, say, 2 million people means you'd kill more than double that now. 
and that virus still circulates, the H3N2 so-called. Then if you want to see what modern science can do with unraveling exactly where a virus comes from, this is the simple version of how they tracked the 2009 virus, which was an H1N1, like the original um, Spanish flu, like a virus that popped up again in 1977, potentially out of a Russian lab, I might point out. This was a reassortant virus that came out of pigs into humans in Mexico and California that had three different origins, three different major sets of genes coming from different origins that reassorted all together over a period of 40 odd years to come up with something in a pig that could be transmitted easily to humans. And that was the H1N1 virus from 2009, which is sufficiently unlike the circulating H1N1 that derived from the 1977 virus that you didn't necessarily have decent immunity to it. So it caused a pandemic and it killed 250,000 odd people, but it was not particularly severe. But th these are the events that cause what you see when the seasonal viruses change. In other words, they change reasonably slightly, but enough to potentially give you a mild disease or whether they change radically, which is what happens in pandemics, which is when you get new hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, or maybe just hemagglutinin and other genes potentially, which is what causes the severity to change, and you get a whole new virus causing a pandemic. So what basically happened in 2009 is viruses that have been circulating from 1918 when pigs caught it from people that have been circulating in pigs in Europe and in the US and Mexico since 1918 through to 2009 with some additions, additions from other sources, including birds, but basically a virus that had circulated in pigs for 90 odd years popped back out into humans. And in a pandemic year, this is a very good sentiment to have um, straight out of Lord of the Rings. And with that, I'll give back to you, Howard. Um, Ed, so if I can ask you sort of to apply retrospectively these insights, what, what do you think is yeah. likely to have been happening between 1914 and 1918? A drift, drift, and then suddenly a shift? Or is it drift, 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 and then cumulatively produces a completely new strain? It's almost certainly um, antigenic shift because the, as you know, Jeffrey Taubenberger and colleagues reconstructed the genome of the 1918 virus from um, archival samples of tissue samples from that were taken by US Army physicians um, and found that it looked almost exactly as if it had popped straight out of birds. So something happened, a bird virus in good standing got into humans, potentially by an intermediate host, much as uh, we suspect COVID got into humans now, mm -hmm. um, and caused a disease. Now, at first, when these adaptations happen, that's an adaptation of a brand new bird virus getting into humans. The virus may not be particularly infectious. In other words, it's not particularly well adapted to infecting humans therefore may cause sporadic disease, may cause severe disease, but may not actually be that infectious. So it's not transmissible particularly well between humans. So mm -hmm. the adaptation that follows that could mean that something that was reasonably nasty but not very well transmitted stayed nasty and became much better transmitted. That's what happened in the milieu of the um, military camps. We've got all of these hosts in close proximity and with not particularly good hygiene um, and just had a chance to go completely wild. You get that genetic selection for the thing that will be transmitted, which is then transmitted as a result of people going home and, be, and the war finishing, which is a major factor. Why it looked like it changed between early 1918 and later 1918 is not clear. Um, I know we've speculated about this previously could it have changed further? And the answer is yes, it may have. 
we don't actually know because there's not that many samples that have been reconstructed and certainly not from earlier. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the one gap um, a little later we'll, we'll talk about the reconstruction, but that's the reconstruction of the virus which was deadly in the second wave, but we don't have any examples of the virus in the first wave, so we've got nothing to compare it against to say how different. So, so Ed, I mean, really, um, the, the, I suppose the next question is, um, why was it so deadly to, to young adults? And then why did it appear to, to vanish? Why did it sort of disappear? It never disappeared. It stayed with us. That virus was around in the human population until 1957. So in other words, um, 1916, possibly right through to 1957, that virus was in the human population. It got um, it got replaced by H2N2 in 1957 as a circulating virus. So, uh, um, was, was there some immunity which had been built up because of its immense uh, speed and extent of spread, so that in 1920 and 21, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it didn't manifest? Uh, anything like as seriously and severely as, as a couple of years earlier? Influenza viruses do adapt. I mean, once the pandemic virus emerges and does what the 1918 virus did and carries on being transmitted, because that's not necessarily a given. If it carries on being transmitted, the, the odds are it will probably become milder. But mm -hmm. in any case, there is an increasing number of people every time the virus goes around, more and more people have had it and are therefore immune. Um, and therefore, if they get infected, they'll have a milder disease and a lot of people will be immune. So herd or partial herd immunity is obviously going to be a factor in its right. seasonal spread, which is why um, seasonal spread, you don't get as many people infected as you would in a pandemic because there is a baseline of immunity amongst a lot of people. Right, okay, okay. So it's it's really, in a sense, the, the virus almost outsmarts itself, and here's the danger of turning it into a person. It almost outsmarts itself by infecting so many people that a degree of immunity is built up so that it has a relatively small number of people to, uh, re to infect, and so it, it more or less uh, moves into the background. Which is why it's, um, its effects are worst in small kids and elderly people. Small kids because they haven't seen it before and elderly people because their immune system is failing, basically. Their immunity is waning. Right, right. So um, it, if I look at a his, as a historian then, uh, after the, the catastrophe of 1918-1919, uh, it seems to me that... Uh, medical scientists across the world, quite understandably and logically, and we can recognize the same response now, uh, are in desperate hurry to try and find, first of all, what is causing it, and then secondly, how might we counter it? So how did they go about identifying what caused it? Because in 1918, as uh, Medi said right at the beginning, um, they didn't know that there was such a thing as a virus, let alone a flu virus. They thought it was caused by a bacterium. So in the space, I think, did you say 1933, when it was um, identified, uh, what, what, what are the sort of steps that, that, that took place to reach that point of identification? And as you said, uh, thanks to ferrets, which otherwise I don't think get, get much praise uh, uh, generally around the world. The... They had known about viruses since 1898, but then this is this is only 20 years later. There some human viruses had been described, and in fact, in 1917, sorry, 1918, and in 1919, a French, two sets of French um, scientists and a Japanese physician, both claimed that this was a so-called filterable virus. Because what you do is you take um, an extract of some kind and they use everything from um, blood from affected people through to nasal secretions, through to throat swabs, etc. And then inoculated this onto animals and in fact in a couple of, a couple of instances into people. After filtering it through the reasonably um, newly invented 
Chambalan filter, Pasteur Chambalan filter, which filters out everything um, above a certain size, and that included all bacteria. So you end up with essentially a sterile fluid, but something that could actually contain viruses, because virus particles are much smaller than bacteria. Mm -hmm. And in 1918 and 1919, the claim had been made. It's just that the British American literature didn't take too much notice of this, despite the fact that um, a Japanese physician published in The Lancet, for example. But it took until um, people knew how to isolate viruses more effectively and had a decent animal model, which was the ferret, to allow isolation of it away from everything else. There was a, an American who had claimed that he'd isolated it from pigs, but then he said that it only caused disease in association with bacteria and then proceeded to try and prove this for humans as well, which failed. And it took a British team to actually find out or characterize it as a filterable virus of humans that could be transmitted to ferrets and in fact could be transmitted the other way. And it took another invention, which was um, being able to culture viruses in eggs, which only really happened around about 1936 that okay. allowed virus to be isolated in the way that we could do it now, for example, because they, they couldn't do it in uh, cell culture because it hadn't been invented yet. But eggs are a pretty good substitute because, in fact, it looks a lot like the cell culture once you've spread the thing out. And one could actually get in and start looking at virus strains, for example. And in, the in 1941, they already had experimental vaccines for flu oh, based, really? on, based on egg culture. So that's the virology behind it. Nothing could happen before there was a couple of technological advances that let it happen. And the chief among those was actually egg culture. Okay, okay, okay. So really those uh, a dozen or so years between 1919 and 1933 uh, are years of rapid attempts to try and identify the virus and mm. then success in 1933 uh, thanks to uh, ferrets, uh, yes. which will uh, probably give ferrets a, a, a distinction, otherwise not, not easily won. Um, so then, I mean, uh, as you say, it, it moves into attempts to uh, fine tune identification and then the beginning of a vaccine. But then the dramatic history of influenza uh, becomes quite uh, astonishing in the 1990s when um, a uh, almost a, a, a amazing uh, ability to try and actually reconstruct the 1918 virus takes place. And there's a bit of a background to this. Ed, you already mentioned um, that in 1998 we, we had the first international conference on the Spanish flu here in, in, in Cape Town and at UCT. And one of the attendees was uh, Jeffrey Taubenberger, uh, who's a molecular pathologist. And I just want to give you a little bit of background and Ed, you can, and there's yeah. some questions which I have, which I'll pose to you as we, as we go along. Um, uh, Jeffrey Taubenberger uh, was a prominent member of a team in Washington at the American Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And they had just, uh, begun to take advantage of a wholly new process. Is it called polymerized chain reaction? Polymerized which, chain reaction. Right. Um, I, I'm going to ask you exactly to explain what mm. that is. Um, I'm having difficulty even pronouncing it, let alone understanding it. Um, and um, this gives to them an ability to take a specimen from someone who had died in 1918 and try and uh, analyze the remains of that virus uh, in that specimen of, of lung. Um, the American Armed Forces Institute has collected since the 1860s, uh, after the American Civil War, specimens from soldiers and others uh, who had died. And it has consequently, it built up a huge museum of uh, these specimens. And wanting to try out and wanting to experiment with uh, this new uh, process, um, Jeffrey Taubenberg and his team found in the uh, museum the remains of a young 
of the lung, a specimen of the lung taken from a young private, uh, Roscoe Vaughan, who had died 21 years old uh, in 1918 from Spanish flu. And um, we've got here, let's see if we can get the share screen working. Here is actually the sample, the specimen taken. If you look on the left, you'll actually see it says 14148, that's the reference number, ACC1140, lung bronchopneumonia. And this is the specimen next to it on the right and then further to the right um, from Roscoe Vaughan's lung. And using this, the uh, team headed by Jeffrey Taubenberger began to try and reconstruct uh, not reconstruct, uh, uh, find the remains of the virus which had killed the young Roscoe Vaughan in 1918. They found one other very good sample from another soldier, and this allowed them to try and probe exactly the nature of this virus. Um, Ed, can you perhaps now explain um, what would they do in this process of polymerized chain reaction to turn this rather unpromising looking slide into something which can tell them about the nature of the deadly virus of 1918. This is another technological advance that had to happen before you could do something with this. I mean, uh, RNA viruses are notoriously labile. In other words, it really doesn't take much to break them up at all. And especially when you've exposed the RNA, then the environment is full of enzymes that can break it up, chemicals that can damage it and the like. So the possibility of finding any intact um, virus nucleic acid after such a long time is almost nil, except, and the other case was permafrost uh, samples, for example, or um, stored medical samples, pathology samples. And here, this would be a wax sample, probably fixed with formaldehyde formalin beforehand. Right, right. Which is right. a good thing and a bad thing because it, stops everything happening, but then it also potentially chemically alters the nucleic acid so that you have to try and reverse that and then subject it to this um, molecular amplification mechanism, which can take vanishingly small amounts of nucleic acid and using uh, single strand nucleic acids that are specific for that piece can use a um, amplification technique just called polymerase chain reaction because that's what it does. It's a chain reaction that doubles every cycle, the amount of nucleic acid that is present in the sample, up to um, around about 30 cycles, which is a billion copies. Two to the power of 30 is a billion copies. So you go for one to a billion, or vanishingly small to enough to work with. And enough to work with means putting it, um, doing sequencing on it, which was just prior to so-called next-gen sequencing, which has become the vogue now. But polymerase chain reaction and conventional sequencing was enough for people to take a look at the nucleic acids from samples like that and from the permafrost samples and say with all confidence that this was a hemagglutinin gene, this is a neuraminidase gene, etc., of that original um, influenza virus and show that it wasn't, similar, uh, wasn't identical to anything that was in the lab at the time, because this technique is bedeviled by contamination, because it is so sensitive. And having done that, piece together the bits. You do so-called primer walking, which means that you amplify overlapping bits of sequence, and then piece it all together in a computer and come up with the entire genome sequence. I remember being blown away by this at the time, thinking, wow, this is absolutely incredible as a virologist. And then, of course, other virologists looked at this and said, are you completely crazy? You can't resurrect the Spanish flu, uh, which I find to be a very odd thing to think because we were all effectively immune to it. That virus circulated until 1957, then it came back in 1977. So every single adult over the age of, well, in fact, up until very recently, when it got supplanted by the so-called swine flu, every person on the planet just about was immune to H1N1 influenza. So re-releasing the Spanish flu would really not have done very much. But the fact that they were able to get the sequence, and then it's another tour de force, and again, it required technology. 
to be able to synthesize and to clone all of the elements of it into an infectious genome, which is no trivial thing at all. And then show that this thing looked a lot like a bird virus, but it could bind to the kinds of cells, the, it could bind to specific receptors in human airways that bird viruses generally can't, and that it was especially virulent. It was nasty. If you put this thing in cell culture, it killed off cells much quicker than um, seasonal flu viruses do, for example. So they could get a very good idea of exactly what um, the virus could do, how it caused the damage that it caused, because that was one of the biggest hallmarks. People healthy one day and dead three days later, their lungs essentially dissolved. That was, and that was one of the most important findings in modern virology. Right. It's um, uh, it's a bit like, um, seems to me, um, you start being able to do an identikit of the virus and then mm. you actually reconstruct uh, the, the killer. Here, in <laughs> fact, is Jeffrey Taubenberger and uh, his chief assistant, Anne Reed, uh, with, I think, that uh, genome sequence, uh, uh, having a look at that reconstruction. Um, and um, they use these two samples from the American uh, Armed Forces Institute uh, Museum to reconstruct, but then literally out of left field, there appeared another sample, fresh sample. And here's a dramatic story. Um, uh, just bear with me for a moment. Um, in uh, response to their publication in Science of uh, their finding, they received a, a, a letter from an elderly pathologist uh, Johann Hilton, who said, um, back in 1951, I went up to Alaska, to the Seaward Peninsula. There you see it, uh, extreme uh, left-hand side of Alaska, almost just across the Bering Sea from uh, Siberia. I went up in 1951 because I thought I would be able to take some samples and uh, try and reconstruct uh, the identity of the killer virus. In 1951, uh, that wasn't possible. And so he took his samples back to his laboratory and was un unable to do anything with it. And now suddenly in 1997, uh, he reads this article in Science and he writes to Taubenberg and he says, do you want some more samples? I can go back to the Seaward Peninsula in Alaska and get you a fresh sample. I know exactly where to look. I know the graves of Inuits who died in huge numbers in 1918. And uh, Taubenberger is absolutely blown away by this. And he says, yes, yes, yes. And here goes Johann Hulton by himself up to the Seaward Peninsula to have a look again at the grave sites uh, at a, uh, an old mission station called Brevig. And that's the original grave, grave site at Brevig with large numbers of graves. 72 out of 80 residents, inhabitants of Brevig died in the Spanish flu. So it was an absolute catastrophe. And then he gets the permission of the local uh, elders to actually exhume uh, bodies from uh, the 1918 toll. And this is a picture of him in 1951. He's the young man on the extreme left doing uh, ex or attempting exhumation, but as I said, without success, uh, he gets the specimen, but he cannot do anything effective with it. And here is Johann Hulten in 1997, now a good deal older, down in the grave, and you can see he's got some of the skeletal remains there. And if you look very carefully, just uh, off center, there's his wife's garden shears, which he took up with him to take the specimen. And he finds a specimen of a particularly uh, um, well padded woman. And uh, that means that she's been in the permafrost and the, the virus has not uh, been affected. And consequently, he then takes the specimens and he takes them back to uh, the US and to uh, uh, Jeffrey Taubenberger. And suddenly Taubenberger, having worked with these two uh, uh, elderly specimens from the museum, gets a fresh specimen which confirms exactly the structure and nature of that virus. And then just to add to the whole drama of this, I mean, the late 1990s and the early 2000s is just filled with drama. 
a quite from a quite different uh, angle, a young uh, Canadian geographer hits on the same idea to look at specimens from uh, people who died in 1918, buried in the permafrost, but now in the northern, northern part of Norway, particularly right up in the Spitsbergen Islands at Svalbard, and particularly at the uh, cemetery at Longyearbyen. And she gathers together a huge team, 16 people, uh, to go up and look at uh, the sites where seven young uh, Norwegian miners were buried uh, after succumbing to this flu in 1918. And she goes up and uh, that's the snow covered, ice covered uh, graveyard at uh, Longyearbyen. And there uh, in spring of 1997, uh, they go down to these seven graves and under cover of tents with all kinds of protection, lest something by way of that virus re-escapes, uh, they exhume the bodies. Here, in fact, is the beginning of the exhumation, a local priest turning the first sod before they dig down. And what they find, alas, 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 this huge team, the, the project was about a half a million dollars worth of funding. They find that, in fact, these uh, seven young men had been buried too close to the surface and so had not remained frozen in the permafrost. And they take some samples from this, but it really isn't uh, of any uh, significant use. So there in the late 1990s, suddenly there is this opportunity to try and uh, get samples from people who died, use these samples, and that's what Taubenberger is able to do. Um, Kirsty Duncan, uh, is, is sort of rather crestfallen uh, at uh, the failure of, of her uh, uh, expedition. And eventually she writes a book uh, in which she points fingers in all sorts of directions uh, about people who uh, um, really uh, said one thing and did another. Um, so Ed, um, let, let's tie up our conversation and then open uh, it to the uh, uh, attendees. Are there parallels between the influenza virus of 1918 and COVID and the coronavirus in COVID-19? There are most certainly parallels. The most important one is this is a respiratory disease or primarily a respiratory disease in the initial stages. I mean, there's a lot of evidence now that COVID-19 has in fact got all sorts of effects on many other organs and can have very long lasting effects as well. But the basic transmission, the, um, the way the virus gets around is very similar. What it does when it first gets there is very similar. There's a number of important dissimilarities though, as in this is not flu, COVID is not flu. The virus does not affect appear to do very much to small adults, <laughs> uh, children, small children at all. Um, in fact, youngish people don't seem to be too much at risk. However, that is relative in that there's quite a few people in ICUs and people who have died who are 20 years old or younger. Um, it predominantly affects the elderly, which flu does. It predominantly affects those with co comorbidities in terms of causing severe disease, which flu does too. Um, an important thing is though that this does not pop out of birds, but of the furry bird variety, almost certainly comes out of bats originally, as do at least two of the other human coronaviruses. MERS virus, for example, um, almost certainly came out of bats into camels and then into people. SARS, the original severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, came out of bats through an intermediate host, which may or may not have been palm civets or other um, mammal in uh, meat markets into people. And then the human coronaviruses that cause the common cold also came into humans from other sources. At least one of those was bovine and may have been bat originally as well. So flu comes out of birds. Uh 
Um, coronavirus looks like it predominantly, it, it gets into humans, predominantly comes out of bats. But there the similarities stop because the viruses are so different that the same things that cause flu to mutate as fast as it does and to recombine the way it does, which is reassort in fact. And um, they're Lego pieces, you can mi mix them up much more easily than you can if the whole genetic constitution of the virus is in one piece, which is what SARS is, uh, SARS-CoV is. Now, it also does not mutate anything like as fast as flu does. So this antigenic drift, as opposed to shift, doesn't happen, or it doesn't happen nearly as quickly. Ed, one of the questions which is coming in, and now let's turn to at least a, a selection of some of these questions. How do you account for the greatly differing corona death rates in Gauteng versus the Western Cape and in South Africa versus the UK? Does childhood <coughs> TB inoculation play a significant role? There's clinical trials aimed at answering exactly this question right now and whether a fresh vaccination with BCG, which is the bacillus calmet Garin, which is the um, TB vaccine, whether that in fact, that in fact helps um, healthcare professionals avoid severe disease. There is a possibility. Uh, other people have noted that um, in countries where BCG vaccination is commonplace, and mo most of the Western Hemisphere isn't as commonplace as it is towards the East and the South. So in other words, Western Europe and the US don't have anything like as high rates of BCG vaccination as Eastern Europe, Asia and Africa do. So maybe as for Gauteng versus Cape Town, I, I think it's too early to tell. You can't really say anything now because it hasn't hit peak in either place yet. Um, Cape Town, of course, has much more TB than Joburg does, but Joburg is not exactly too far behind. Gauteng is not too far behind. Um, and the HIV prevalence probably similar, and that is a comorbidity that everybody was very, very scared would be a major problem in this country. Turns out not to be as bad as they thought it was if people are on antiretrovirals. Uh, Ed, a second question here. Is there immunity from the mother? Um, why is the neonate affected when there should be maternal antibodies present? Is has this actually been shown that a mother who has had um, the disease has a baby that then catches it? I'm not sure that that has actually happened because the antibodies that actually do get from mother to child, and especially with breastfeeding, should take care of some of that. Um, there is some evidence that mothers can pass the virus on to neonates. That has happened. Um. Here's, here's a question from a different uh, angle. Um, did the overuse of aspirin in 1918 uh, accentuate to accelerate the number of, of deaths? I don't know. I would, actually, I would think that that's not that likely. I think that the uh, fact that medical care was reasonably primitive at the time and the moment that you got a bacterial co-infection that you were essentially doomed because there was no way of treating the bacteria is much more important factor. And so um, um, many of the deaths in 1918 were due to secondary infection and pneumonia. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, in yeah. an enormous number, which is why they thought it was a bacterial disease in the first place, because samples that came out of people's lungs that you could culture were, of course, all bacterial. Yeah, uh, uh, just let me add uh, a, a historian's question or, or comment. Um, given the hyper, hyper patriotism uh, during World War I, uh, many uh, contemporaries said aspirin comes from, it's made by Bayer in Germany. It's actually uh, spread by uh, surreptitiously within the aspirin. Uh, there, there's scores of questions here. Ed, you and I can go on talking uh, uh, and dealing with these questions probably for another hour. But um, I think we are almost up in terms of uh, our first hour. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Medi again, um, and we'll have a look at these questions and see if perhaps we can consolidate uh, some of them and, and provide some answers uh, uh, separately. Uh, Ed, thank you uh, very much indeed.
um, as always, stimulating and uh, a learning experience uh, uh, chatting to you. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking part in this rich and fascinating webinar. Um, and thank you very, very much to our two, two presenters. Um, just to say the last webinar in the series will be on Wednesday, the 29th of July. And in this webinar, Professor Howard Phillips will be in conversation with health journalist Mia Malan, discussing public health perspectives of the 1980 flu epidemic and implications for COVID-19. Can we all just stay on and just have a quick chat? Yes. Yeah.